It was a brisk autumn night. Gordon was making his way down the main line with the night express. Leaves danced around him in the wind as the moon filled the night sky. Gordon was making great time until he came to the viaduct. Bother! He huffed. And I was going so nicely too. The viaduct was undergoing repairs, so the engines had to take great care when crossing it. Gordon knew it was for his own safety, but he couldn't help but grumble about it. An express engine like me shouldn't have to go so slow, he groused. How am I supposed to keep to time with these silly speed limits? As Gordon slowly approached the viaduct, the air suddenly grew cold. The wind stopped blowing. Everything was still and quiet. Gordon didn't want to admit it, but he was feeling rather uneasy. Then he heard the sound of faint crying nearby. What's that? called his driver and applied the brakes. Gordon stopped, and there, in front of him, was a young woman standing on the side of the line, crying her eyes out. Excuse me, ma'am, said Gordon. Is something the matter? Are you lost? The woman didn't say anything. She just kept crying by the side of the line. Gordon's fireman climbed out of the cab in an attempt to comfort the woman. But no sooner had he set foot on the viaduct that the woman let out an ear-piercingly loud scream. Then she rushed towards the edge of the viaduct and jumped straight off down into the black void below. Gordon and his firemen were in shock. They had never witnessed anything so horrible. The driver helped the firemen back into the cab and quickly hurried to Wellsworth to notify the station master. What's the matter? called Edward from his shed. A woman's jumped off the viaduct! exclaimed Gordon's driver. We need a rescue team immediately! Edward turned pale. The station master telephoned the police at once, and soon a rescue operation was underway. Edward was asked to shunt Gordon home. The big engine was in such a terrible state of shock that he couldn't even speak. The other engines were respectfully silent as Edward pushed Gordon into the sheds. Edward, however, looked more solemn than sad. The next morning, the Fat Controller and the Chief of Police arrived at the sheds. James, you'll be handling Gordon's Express while he and his firemen recover from last night's ordeal. James quietly looked over at Gordon, who hadn't slept a wink or said a single word all night. But sir, what about the woman? Did the police find her? We're still continuing our search said the chief of police. But some of my men will stand guard on the bridge to ensure something like this doesn't happen again. This relieved the engines a little, but Edward was still uneasy. That night, James took the express as planned. As he approached the viaduct, he saw several officers standing guard at both ends. You're safe to cross, called an officer. Good! thought James, and began to slow down. But as James neared the middle of the viaduct, he heard the sound of sobbing nearby. And there, in front of him, was a young woman, standing by the edge of the viaduct. James fell silent. He recognised the danger instantly, but didn't know what to do. James's fireman tried to approach the woman to help, but the woman let out a violent screech and plummeted into the depths below. It was a few hours before Edward finally brought James back to the sheds. The Red Engine's fireman had been taken to the hospital for shock, and the police had once again been called to the viaduct, 
but the officers on guard couldn't understand how a woman had managed to get onto the viaduct without them noticing. They say they were all awake and alert, said the chief of police next morning to the fat controller. They even stopped hikers from crossing the viaduct minutes before the woman jumped. It just doesn't make sense. Regardless of how it happened, it must stop, replied the fat controller firmly. Then, in a quiet, saddened voice, he added, I can't handle knowing that two fine young women took their lives on this island. Meanwhile, at the sheds, Henry was also feeling upset. It's just not right, he said mournfully. To think that two women jumped off the viaduct to their doom in the last two nights. In all my days, I've never known anyone who'd do such a thing. I can't imagine what their poor families are going through right now. Edward, who had stayed at the sheds overnight to help comfort Gordon and James, could bear it no longer. It wasn't two women, he muttered quietly. And this isn't the first time this has happened. Henry looked over. Pardon? It was before you arrived, began Edward. Thomas and I had just finished building the main line. Other engines helped work the railway before you and the others joined us. One engine in particular pulled trains on the main line with me. He didn't have a name, just a number. 38. Number 38 was a young engine who, despite his naivety, always tried to do his best. He would often pull commuter trains, stopping at each station along the line. One of his favourite stations was Wellsworth. There he would see a friendly young woman named Margaret. She had a great interest in the railway and always took time out of her day to say hello to the passing trains. Oh, she loved all the engines, but number 38 was her favourite. The two would often talk for so long that number 38 would be late at the next station. <laughs> Edward gave a faint chuckle at this. Number 38 and Margaret became very close friends, and sometimes Margaret would visit the engine sheds to visit number 38 once his day's work was done. Even when number 38 was at his gloomiest, seeing Margaret always cheered him up. Edward paused, then took a deep breath. <sighs> One day, number 38 arrived at Wellsworth like usual. As his crew went inside the station to use the loo, he saw Margaret was standing on the platform. This wasn't unusual. But what was unusual was how she seemed to be covering her left eye. Is something the matter, Margaret? asked number 38. Oh no, it's nothing, said Margaret quietly. Well, it can't be nothing if you're covering your eye like that, replied number 38. Now come on, what's there to hide? Margaret sighed and removed her hand. Number 38 was shocked. Margaret's eye was swollen shut and was now coloured a horrid mix of black and red. Good gracious me! exclaimed number 38. What happened? It's nothing, insisted Margaret. Archibald and I had a little argument last night, that's all. He didn't mean to hurt me, so don't worry about it. Number 38 wasn't sure about this. He really wanted to tell his driver and fireman about Margaret's injury, but he didn't want to upset her either. So when his crew returned from the loo, he begrudgingly stayed quiet. Sadly, this would only be the start of many more injuries for Margaret. Whenever number 38 saw her after that day, another part of her would be bruised, swollen, or sometimes broken. But no matter how serious the injury was, 
Margaret would always insist that number 38 not tell anyone because it was an accident. <laughs> number 38 soon found himself in a very troubling dilemma. He desperately wanted to try and stop Margaret from going through more pain, but didn't want to go against her wishes by telling someone about her situation. Eventually, number 38 became so conflicted that he stopped speaking to Margaret. He couldn't even look at her anymore, as even seeing Margaret would remind number 38 of his inner turmoil and upset him deeply. Margaret tried everything she could to speak to number 38, but no matter what she did, she was only greeted with silence. Eventually, Margaret stopped coming to Wellsworth, and all number 38 could do was hope that things would work out by themselves. Edward sighed. <sighs> One autumn evening, number 38 stopped at Wellsworth with his commuter train like usual. He glanced over at the platform where Margaret used to wait for him. Number 38 hadn't seen her in over a month and was feeling depressed about the whole situation. As he continued down the line, he suddenly heard a shrill scream in the distance, followed by several more. They seemed to be getting louder. Whatever that is, it doesn't sound good, said the driver. And opening number 38's regulator, they hurried out to the source of the noise. Soon they approached the viaduct where they saw a horrible sight. There was Margaret standing on the edge of the viaduct and screaming fit to burst with Archibald, get pistol down. in hand, shouting get at her down, to get you down. Damn it, you stupid woman! <laughs> Stop! Here, you cried number bitch. 38, but his cries fell on deaf ears. Then the unthinkable happened. Margaret leaped off the viaduct. Everyone was as still as ice. The splash from the river seemed to echo through the valley. The guard hurried off to phone for the police, but Archibald had already fled the scene. After a week-long manhunt, he was found and confessed to abusing Margaret for months leading up to the incident and was sentenced to life in prison. But sadly, Margaret's body was never found. Number 38 was hit the hardest from Margaret's untimely passing and found himself so traumatized by the events that he wouldn't even go near the viaduct, so he was sent to the back of the sheds. He kept replaying the events of that day in his head, always blaming himself for Margaret's passing saying that had he just gone for help at the first sign of trouble, she would still be alive. The other engines and I tried our best to console him, but eventually, number 38 became so troubled by his thoughts that the fat director had no choice but to send him away. <sighs> I remember seeing him as he left Sodor. His eyes were completely drained of their joy or youth and all that remained was nothing but pain. It's a look I'll never forget. No one knows what happened to number 38 after that, but every time an engine slows down across the fire duct at night, Margaret returns to her spot, hoping that number 38 has come to save her from Archibald's fury. But number 38 never comes, and Margaret is doomed to suffer an eternity of failing. Henry's boiler was as cold as ice, and without a word, he shuddered away to collect the express, leaving behind a very distraught Edward. That night, Henry was so worried about crossing the viaduct that he wouldn't steam properly, so Edward volunteered to take the express in his place. Better him than me, muttered Henry. Be careful, Edward, called James. If you see someone jump, you won't be able to shunt yourself back to the sheds. You're either the bravest engine I know or the silliest, added Gordon. Edward took no notice and bravely headed off to the station. A few minutes later, 
Edward was making good time along the main line. The coaches were running along nicely, and the rails were smooth. But Edward was only thinking about what lay ahead. Soon, too soon for Edward, he passed through Wellsworth Station and began making his way towards the viaduct. As Edward rounded the final bend, fog began to roll in. Now she's just teasing me, he muttered, and began to slow down. As Edward puffed onto the viaduct, he began to feel uneasy, but he knew he had to keep going. Right on cue, the sound of Margaret crying filled the air. Edward looked down to find Margaret standing by the edge of the viaduct, just like she had been for Gordon and James. Edward took a deep breath. Hello, Margaret, he sighed. Margaret looked up. She seemed puzzled. It's me, said Edward slowly. Number 38. Margaret walked over to Edward, as if she couldn't believe her old friend had finally come to see her again. I'm sorry it's taken so long, puffed Edward quietly. I was just so scared to see you again because I was worried you wouldn't want to see me again. But I want you to know that... Edward began to tear up. I'm so... I'm so sorry for forcing you to go through all that suffering all those years ago, cried Edward. I was young and inexperienced. I never meant to hurt you. Oh, oh, Margaret, I'm so sorry. It's all my fault. Margaret stared at the old engine. She could see the year's worth of pain re-emerging in her old friend's eyes. Then she placed her hand on Edward's buffer, looking up at the old engine's sorrowful face and smiled. It wasn't the largest smile, but it was enough for Edward to know that Margaret had forgiven him. And just like that, Margaret disappeared into the night, gently being carried away on the wind to her proper resting place. After that, there were no more sightings of women jumping off the viaduct and work on the railway continued like normal. The engines were relieved to no longer have to experience the horrors that Gordon and James did, but Edward was just happy to no longer have the burdens of his past continue to weigh him down, for he now knows that Margaret is no longer suffering and is instead, after so many years, truly happy. And for Edward, that's all he could ever ask for.